preservation of and increased access to the 92nd Street Y Humanities Audio Archives is generously funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities. Um, I'd like to welcome you here this evening on behalf of the 92nd Street Y and the Metropolitan Conference of B'nai B'rith. This is the second in our series Hebrew Voices. The first was Amos Oz. Tonight we're privileged to hear David Shachar. And in February we'll have a lecture by Dr. David Patterson. I think you can probably read pretty much for yourself about Mr. Shachar. I don't know how many of you have had the opportunity to read his book. He has written quite a bit, but has only recently been translated into English. The book is entitled News from Jerusalem. The book contains within it sections of a five volume work, two of which have been finished in Hebrew and hopefully will begin translated into English this coming fall be called the Palace of Broken Vessels. This is also another first for Mr. Shahar because it's his first trip to the United States. Before I introduce Mr. Shahar, I just want to remind you, number one, that there's no smoking in here. And I just want to explain to you how we will handle the question period. After Mr. Shahar speaks, there'll be a short break of about four or five minutes You've all been given three by five cards, and if you would write your questions on those cards, the ushers will collect them, and I'm sure that Mr. Shahar will be delighted to answer them. It's now my great pleasure to introduce David Shahar. Thank you so much, Sima. I, uh, is there uh, absolutely necessity of using this thing? Um, I came a little late, and Sima told me she was afraid I was mugged. This is an expression I learned here, to be mugged. And... Uh, when she said it, I remember that once upon a time, some 25 years ago, I wrote a story in Hebrew, naturally, I'm a Hebrew writer, which was about mugging. I myself was the mugger. And I mugged then for a packet of cigarettes. You see, I keep smoking to this day. <laughs> and uh, I have an ashtray here. Uh, I learned the expression mugging here. I knew that what it means, but the expression is new to me, I didn't know before. Uh, but perhaps since I started with mugging, I won't finish with it. Allow me one uh, perhaps remark which has nothing to do with what I want to say tonight. Tonight I want to tell you something of the experiences of a Jerusalem-born writer. I am born in Jerusalem and my language is Hebrew, not English. Uh, one remark, this is the first time I am in the United States. The second time I'm out of my country and my city. I was born 48 years ago in Jerusalem and the first time I left Jerusalem I was already a man of 37 years old. And then I went to Paris for a short time. Now it's the second time I'm out of my country. And here, when I heard about mugging, that was very shortly after I came here, when I wanted to see the streets in the night, downtown at night. And people explained to me that it's not done. Yet I had an opportunity to see how it looks at night. And I heard the stories. I felt 
there is mugging all over the, the world. I mean, people do things for money or for drugs or for cigarettes or for anything else. They do it. But perhaps the difference is in the attitude of the public. Jerusalem is a dangerous city. Uh, Israel is dangerous. It's dangerous to live there. And yet, my son, who is 15 years old, goes each Friday to another party given by one of his classmates. He may walk for an hour, an hour and a half, between midnight and one o'clock in the morning. I don't worry. I don't worry. Or a girl student may go out of, a, of the campus and walk at night. I don't worry, not because there is not a possibility of mugging, but because I know that if anything happens and the child cries out for help, or the girl cries up for help, out for help, a hundred people from hundred closed apartments will jump from the beds to help her. This is the instinctive, instinctive rush towards the one who is in need of help. And it's very strong in Israel. I mean, when, if anyone falls or anyone cries for help or something happened, you'll see within seconds, you'll see a whole crowd around to give help. Whilst here I understand, if I have not been uh, misinformed, uh, uh, they won't rush so eagerly to one's help, especially not at night. They won't jump out of the beds, open the doors, and rush outside to help a woman who is mugged. But anyhow, that was something which has nothing to do. I only remember it because uh, that was how I was introduced this evening into this house, that there was some fright of my being mugged. Well, I was not. And in the far history, I was the mugger. I didn't succeed very well, as anyone who may care to read the translation into English of this story. Now, only now appeared a small selection from my writing into English. I didn't succeed in it, but anyhow, I did my best. <laughs> I did my best, I didn't succeed. Well, um, I shall tell you, as I said before, something of the, the experiences of a child born in Jerusalem. I shall uh, try to describe my experiences. I shall not give you opinions. First of all, as a writer, I do believe much more in experiences than in opinions. Opinions is something which may change with time. I even do not know whether there is a very strong correlation between one's opinions and one's inner essence. I don't know to what extent the opinion uh, represents the personality. I've had a very good experience concerning that when I came to know, as a young man, a politician in Israel, whose name I won't mention, who was a great fighter for freedom and independence. Freedom and independence, it doesn't matter where. It may be in China, it may be in Korea, it may be in, 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 in uh, Congo Brazzaville. And this great fighter who always stood and fought for independence and liberty was the worst tyrant one can imagine concerning his own wife and children. They didn't have a right to their own opinions at home. They didn't have a right to their own opinions. They had to stick to his opinions. And woe to him of his children who did something or said something which was against the liking of the father. But this man fought for the liberty of opinion. And he was a great fighter. And he succeeded. And he's a politician. And he does well. Besides, I believe very little in politicians. But this is another story, I won't get into it. I shall tell you something about my experiences, and uh, which will, of course, lead uh, to questions regarding our actual time. 
and I shall be glad to answer anything you may ask me to the best of my possibility and ability. Before that, uh, another aside uh, concerning uh, my language, the language in which I give expression to what I feel, which is the Hebrew language. I was born into the Hebrew language. My parents talked Hebrew to me, and they themselves learned Hebrew at school in those days. So when they learned Hebrew, it was under the Turkish Empire. I already belonged to the British Empire, my childhood. That's how I come to speak English to you. My language was Hebrew, but at school, the second language, the foreign language, was English. And I'm not sorry that I learned English in that way. So something good happened under the British Empire. <laughs> at least I learned some English. But anyhow, I belonged in my youth to the British Empire, and they belonged to the Turkish Empire. And uh, somehow or other, you know, that we always find ourselves squeezed in and torn to pieces between empires. It has always been so, I don't know why. Even in the past ancient history, you all know it. So they spoke Hebrew, they learned it in those days. And uh, my ear is very sensitive to that language. And I, when I hear somebody talk, say something, I can place him immediately. That is to say, not only his, uh, his formal intellectual achievements or uh, formation or education, but his environment, where he came from. And for me, it's a pleasure. Um, and uh, I uh, said something about the Hebrew language. I was supposed to say a few words and to give something more technical that I, I won't do it here. When I was, before coming here, I was at the University of Wisconsin in Madison. And there I had two classes. I think they were almost wholly composed of non-Jews who learned Hebrew. I think one was a class of nuns and the other of priests. And uh, we had there very interesting discussions about the English, uh, Hebrew language. And I made a remark, which is well known, but perhaps we should think about it sometimes. I have a daughter of six years. Her name is Dina. She speaks Hebrew. When she says the everyday common words, like Abba, Father, Ima, Mother, Shamaim, Sky, Bait, House. She uses the very same words, the very same words that were used by our forefathers 3,000 years ago. Abraham, Yitzchak, and Yaakov used the very same words. Of course, there are layers in the language. Even in the Bible, the Bible itself has layers of language. We all know it. And the layers which came post, the post-biblical layers, the Mishnaic, the Rabbinical, etc. I won't get into it. But the differences are mainly differences in the construction of the sentence and in the conception of time. This is also very interesting, the conception of time. In the Bible, time exists only as past or future. There is no present. And the past may be future, and the future may be past. But except for that, the cardinal words are the same. And when she, she started going to school this year, this very year, when she starts reading, she may open the Bible and read it. And when it is concerned with the cardinal words, everyday words, she will understand every word of it. Now, this is something exceptional, because as we all know, a young Greek who talks Greek, who was born into the language, and wants to read Homer, has to learn a different language, different words. And the same goes for uh, 
I'm looking for my, for my lighter. Ah, you found it. <laughs> yes. He has to learn a, diff a different language for Homer, for his Aristo, or Plato, or uh, Evripides, or uh, Sophocles. It's not the same language. The same goes for a young Italian who wants to learn his forefathers in Latin. Strange as it may seem, it isn't true, it's even true for such a young language as the English language, which is so young, I think it's almost, it's less than 1,000 years, if I'm uh, mistaken, please uh, correct me, something like 1,000 years. I defy you to show me a young Englishman opening his Canterbury Tales and reading it. Beowulf, Canterbury Tales, even Shakespeare is sometimes difficult. But a young Israeli who starts talking Hebrew will open the Bible and use and understand because they are the very same words used thousands of years ago by our forefathers. I said this remark apropos of something else in our conversation in Madison. So they asked me, what's the reason? What do I think the reason is for this? And I said, half jokingly, that the reason I suppose is because the world was created in Hebrew. When God said, Yehi or va Yehi or, let there be light, and there was light, he said it in Hebrew. He didn't say it in Chinese or in Russian or in English. He said it in Hebrew. And if there is something wrong with the world, it's perhaps because the world which was created in Hebrew doesn't speak Hebrew, speaks other languages. <laughs> so, um, anyhow, uh, this is my, uh, the, this remark which I made there uh, in medicine uh, concerns only one aspect of my feeling as a Hebrew writer because I always felt very strongly about the language, very strongly. And uh, though I myself am in no way whatsoever what you may call an observant Jew who makes, uh, I mean, who does everything which is de demanded of him or something which is demanded of him. I, whenever, I mean, any time any place, if there is anything I'm capable of reading, it's the Bible in Hebrew. I mean, uh, sometimes I don't feel like reading. Sometimes I can't read poetry, I can't read po prose, I can't read a book of history or philosophy or whatever you wish. But in whatever mood I am, opening anywhere the Bible in Hebrew, somehow it doesn't, I, uh, whether it's a chapter in uh, Yirmiyahu or a chapter from Genesis or anything, it calms me down. Perhaps this is auto-suggestion, as the psychologists would say nowadays. Well, that was the language into which I was born, and the place was Jerusalem. I am the fifth generation to be born in Jerusalem. My children are the sixth on my part. Their mother has already spoiled the lineage the dynasty, because she herself was not born uh, in Israel. She came as a small child. And I lived uh, as a child in the northern outskirts of town. As a child, I lived with my parents, and I later came to know my grandmother. My grandfather on my father's side died during the, second, the First World War. And, uh, I, um, and so did my other grandfather, uh, but I knew my grandmother. And it's there where I knew my grandmother that I uh, learned a little Yiddish. We were forced to go to live with her when things became very bad economically. I don't know, perhaps uh, now that I come to the United States and I hear about recession, depression, and all these good things, reminds me of my own history that as far as I can remember myself, things have <laughs> went with my family from bad to worse. It started as quite well off, or the generations who came before 
quite well off, and then went down, 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 down in the world. So we went down till we hit rock bottom, and the house and the furniture and everything was auctioned, how do you say? And we went to live with a grandmother who spoke uh, Yiddish. She spoke Yiddish, but she was very conscious conscient of the fact that she was belonged to the old families. The old families who came before Zionism, before what's called political Zionism uh, is concerned. And she used to regard with much contempt, much contempt and a little even sometimes hatred, those who came afterwards. She used to make a very clear division, my grandmother, between those who were the old timers, those who were born there, and what she called in Yiddish the Tsugikumene, those who came later. And for her, those who came later were those who came with the British Empire, those who came after 1917, because she was born already and her parents came half a century or more than half a century back. And she had always a grudge against them. <coughs> which is, I suppose, natural for any woman who comes of an old family and sees her fortunes dwindling, dwindling very rapidly, whilst all the tsugikumene somehow make a living and even become rich sometimes. So uh, she had a very strong feeling against them. She used to say that to me in Yiddish, not in Hebrew. I learned Yiddish from her. I learned Yiddish also from the quarrels between my father and mother. They spoke Hebrew to us, but when they had to quarrel between themselves, it was done in Yiddish, believing that we understood nothing. But we understood everything. <laughs> and uh, so uh, we, we came to learn Yiddish. And here I shall make the first statement of the chief thing which concerned me all my life and all my writings. And this is the question of the relationship between the outward form of things and their inner essence. And their inner essence. Is there a relationship between things? Uh, I shall put it in the aspect it took in the Jewish community and then in the other communities as well. My mother, who considered herself very religious, and indeed I may say that as far as I know, well, you know, ain't tzaddik ba'aretz asher lo yechta. You will never find a saint who hasn't sinned at least once in his life. But as far as I know, she was very, very extremely observant, a woman, extremely. And for her, for, for example, my father and mother and all their offsprings were, were terrible sinners. I mean, sinners who had no... I mean, she, she couldn't see that any salvation will ever come to us with all the sins we did. So this righteous woman spoke Yiddish. She didn't speak Hebrew. And for me, it was also a great question of surprise. I, who was so affected and so formed by the Bible, and the Bible was written in Hebrew. And Avraham, Yitzchak, and Yaakov spoke Hebrew, but she spoke Yiddish. This righteous woman didn't speak Hebrew. Not only did she not speak Hebrew, she considered that Hebrew was uh, speaking Hebrew, I mean, was something bad. A Jew shouldn't speak Hebrew. So she thought, a Jew shouldn't speak Hebrew. She had her very strict notions about uh, what's good and what's bad. And nowadays, it's hard to find, I look around me and I see young generations of observant Jews, none of whom knows what it meant in those days. I mean, the restrictions and the world in which he lived. So to be a good Jew was not to speak Hebrew, to speak other languages. That was because Hebrew should be only prayed, not spoken. So she spoke some sort of German. Yiddish is some sort of old German with mixed Hebrew words or Polish words, other words. And then the way she, was, she wanted me to, to dress, I mean, which was, I suppose, what Jews dressed 
somewhere about four or five hundred years ago in Central Europe. I mean, you were not a good Jew unless you had very black, long dresses and the strimal, that fur hat on the head. And below that fur hat, you had to have a kipale. Two hats, not one hat. Two. One below the other. And if you didn't do that, of course, you were very bad. And one was never supposed to meet his future wife before actually having married her. I mean, you were not supposed to see your bride. And the bride was not supposed to see her, bri her bridegroom. It was only post factum. You found yourself in bed with whom you found, that's that. Nothing doing. <laughs> and whoever didn't do that, uh, it was not a good Jew, and that was a great source of wonder. What is the connection between this and the Bible? I didn't see it. The Bible was written in Hebrew, and in the Bible I never found anything about Streimel or about a long black coat, which was something which came from Europe. I didn't find it there. And I, I mean, so what is the connection between the essence, of essence and this outward form of Judaism. What's the connection between it? It disturbs me to this day. I mean, the question of the essence and it out, its outward form. It's, when I say outward form, I mean also the body. Is there a connection between the soul and the body? The body as a material manifestation? There was once a well-known Jewish woman in France during the occupation, whose name was Simone Weil. They call her Simone Weil. And she is almost considered a saint by the Catholics, even though she never converted. She remained Jewish. And she wrote once, her books were published post, uh, after her death, and she wrote once the following thing that when a beautiful woman looks at a mirror, she thinks that she looks at herself. But when an ugly woman looks at a mirror, she knows that she doesn't look at herself. Is there, is there a connection between the essence, between what go, goes in the essence as something which has the, the, the central meaning, and the outward form. This question all along in the individual life and in the collective life always interested me. So it started with my grandfather, mother, with whom I had a very a great cause concerning, concerning God, the meaning of things, what God wanted or didn't want. I saw very little relevance in the outward forms concerning the essential thing. I mean, it was only when I was alone or in the fields that I somehow felt some sort of presence behind and beyond. I personally never felt it in any closed place, be it a synagogue or any other closed place. I never felt it, and I had always very strong fights with my grandmother about it. But uh, this question of relationship between this world, this material world in which I live, and the essence, went farther than that. I told you I lived in the northern part of Jerusalem, in a quarter called Beit Israel. Then it was the last quarter, the last quarter uh, of the town, after it the, I mean, before us we had fields, and above the fields, on the mountain, on the top of the mountain, there was an Arab village, which was called a Nebi Samuil. Ha ha has anybody of you been to Jerusalem? Please raise your hand so that I may know. Thank you very much. I see that you are all Jerusalemites here. So uh, there is that village, a Nebi Samuil. Now, this is very strange. As a child, 
I was, I told you, I was most, most impressed by the Bible, and wherever I stood, I had a feeling that here, once upon a time, long ago, our forefather walked. Perhaps King David himself walked here. And as for uh, Nebi Samuel, I thought even that uh, since I live opposite his place, if I shall concentrate myself very, very uh, intensively, I might even have some visions of him. Um, I shall perhaps read one sentence concerning this because it's important for my attitude afterwards toward the whole uh, question. Uh, it's something taken out of the novel The Palace of Shattered Vessels. Um, Uh, you know, you who have been to Jerusalem, you know that, I mean, beyond this point of Beit Israel, there are what we call Ma'arot HaSanhedrin, the caves of the Sanhedrin. Have you seen it? These are, I mean, caves dating back 2,000 years to the time of the Second Temple. The time of 2,000 years to the... I mean, when I see in, in the United States very old places, about 200 years old, I mean... Uh, we have there something which is much older, but we don't have the 19th century. This is interesting. We don't have the 19th century, but we have 200 BC, the space of time. So uh, I used to go to those uh, caves. And going there, uh, <clears throat> It whispered that if only I could find the strength to look with total concentration, I would see the prophet Samuel coming home after making his circuit of Beit El and Gilgal and Mitzpah, just like it said in the book of Samuel in the Bible. And his return was to Ramah, for there was his house, and there he judged Israel. I stand and look at the path leading up to Ramah, to his house, and all I have to do for the wheel of time to complete its circuit and come to a stop here on the rock where I'm standing now and where the prophet himself might once have stood is concentrate on it in the right way. The difference between the path and the being of the stone present in the burial niches inside the cave is only one of velocity since the cave is like a brake holding back the wheel of time in its revolutions and slowing it down. And in the depth of the darkness beyond the burial niches, the action of this brake is so strong that fragments of time are torn from the wheel and stick to it, fluttering around it with the living and the dead and the birds listening to disembodied spirits and their buried treasures too. I had this very strong feeling, and with this very strong feeling, I was conscious of the fact that this village, in Arabic, has the very same name. It's called a Nebi Samuel, which is Hanavi Shemuel. Arabic and Hebrew, as you know, are sister languages. And sometimes the difference is only a difference in pronunciation. So it's a Nebi Samuel instead of Hanavi Shemuel. So the Arabs conserved the historical site of Hanavi Shemuel. And they show you to this day where he was buried. And they do it with sometimes astonishing accuracy because the archaeologists will tell you that this is the place. They conserved it, and they conserved the name, the very name, Hanavi Shmuel and Nebi Samuel. They did it not only concerning the much better known, bigger places like Bethlehem and Hebron and Shechem, but even with very small villages. You may, may see the old place Beit El. 
they call it Betal. It's the same place. And you who have been to Jerusalem might have seen that whilst on the one hand you see the city, on the other, if you stand on Mount Scopus, if you stand on Mount Scopus, you see facing you Jerusalem. If you turn back, you see the desert of Judea, Midbar Yehuda, sloping down to the Dead Sea. And before you, on one of the tops of the hills, you see a tiny Arab village, which is called Anata. Anata is Anatot. This is the place where the prophet Jeremiah was born. Divrei Yirmiyahu ben Chilkiyahu min hakohanim asher ba'anatot be'eretz binyamin. Anatot. So they preserved even the place where Yirmiyahu was born and it's called Anata to this very day. And sometimes in my very unholy thoughts I said to myself, looking at the Arab boys coming from this village, who knows if they are not the descendants of the bastards of Irmiyahu? Because after all, it was not the whole Jewish people which was driven out by the Romans. They were only the leaders. Most of the people remained and then were forced to take the, the Muslim uh, religion, as is well known. So they preserved the very name. They preserved the very name, and not only did they preserve it, but they consecrated it. What was, ever, what was holy to my history, to the Bible, became holy and consecrated to them. And wherever there was something holy to us, you'll find built on it a mosque. So if you go to, to an Abbey Samuel, you'll see there is a mosque over the, over the tombstone. Is a mosque. The same goes for the place which is considered to be the burial place of our forefathers in Hebron. You'll see over the tombs there is a mosque. The same goes for other places. Wherever you find something consecrated, it became consecrated to them by force of my history. They preserved it for over 2,000 years. And uh, it's not all, only they who preserve it, others as well. It became consecrated to them. Uh, here I may read perhaps a small section concerning my attitude when I became aware of it. But before it I want to say, they preserved it better than do we do now. It so happens now sometimes that we give, we, we erase old names and give new names, and by thus doing, we erase old historical names. I shall give you one example. Uh, you who have been to Jerusalem know perhaps a street which is called Rehov Agron, leading down from the supermarket and the Heichal Shlomo, down all the way to the, to the, to the gate of, uh, uh, of uh, Yafo, Shar Yafo. This is called Rehov Agron. Now, when I was a child, I had the privilege and the honor to know this Agron. He was the editor and founder of the Palestine Post then, and later it was called the Jerusalem Post. Later on, he became the mayor of Jerusalem. And I studied, at, uh, I was the classmate of uh, one of his daughters. We learned together. After his death, after he, be, he was the mayor of Jerusalem, he died, they called this street on, they gave his name to it, Agron. Before it was called Agron, it had a name, a very ancient name which ran through history. Through the time of the Turks and the Mamelukes and whatever you wish, and Arab, it was called Mamilla Street once. Now Mamilla is a very ancient Hebrew name. This is Milo. This is the place Milo is to fill in, which was filled in because it's a valley. You see, it goes into the valley and it had to be filled in so as to form a road. The Hamilo, which you find, Ale Milo, Yoshvot Ale Milo, and other places, this is the place. Now our Zionist leaders, who didn't realize it, erased the Milo and gave it to Agron. I have nothing against him, find him another street. 
but uh, why give him that, that name? Anyhow, they preserved it. I mean, they preserved the tradition much better than we do now. So like this Rehov Mamila, Milo, which lost its ancient Hebrew name, you'll find some, sometimes because of ignorance or because of political reasons or whatever the reasons, erase old names and give them the name of one or, or other of the leaders. They preserved it and they consecrated it. It became sacred to them because it was sacred to us. How long do I still have to talk? Yes. Uh, I shall perhaps read to you something I had, a feeling I had when I realized it as a child. It's taken from the king's eye. One, six, two. On summer afternoons, I would stretch out full length on the round windowsill and look out towards to Malka at the top of the Mount of Olives and the section of the old city walls facing the crowded square in front of Damascus Gate. Horse-drawn carriages stood side by side with the Arab company buses to Ramallah and Jericho and a few taxi cabs as well. And throngs of Arabs in long robes and kefirs and tabushes milled and jostled between them. Fragments of Arab tunes floated up to my window on Arab smelling breezes. The first wireless sets had just started appearing here and there in Jerusalem. And the first sounds from them to reach my ears were these tunes endlessly spiraling in the long winded cycle, quaking with longings of Arab love songs. The circle of Arab life, which was revealed to me through the telescope in whose tube I lay, the tumultuous life swarming against the background of the Mount of Olives and the Tower of Tumalka, with its haggling and shouting and singing and smells, and its whole being, which was dipped in a dream despite all its uproar, was like a direct continuation of everything I had learned in the Bible about the lives of our forefathers in Eretz Israel. It was in some sense a materialization of those lives awakening ancient chords like those of a long forgotten melody in my heart. But this materialization, despite its being a direct continuation, was not a natural continuation. For it was I who was the scion of the stock of Abraham, Yitzchak, and Yaakov, the natural and lawful heir of King David's dynasty here in David's city. Sometime, Somewhere, something had gone wrong. As if a prince and a beggar had changed clothes in a masquerade, the beggar in the prince's clothes had settled in the king's palace, while the prince had taken up the beggar's staff and set out on a long journey whose vicissitudes had transformed him beyond recognition. But this feeling did not apply only to what I saw in the non-Jewish communities, the Arabs. The same went also for the Christians. As a child, I remember which struck me, a thing which struck me personally, was when I went for a walk on the eastern side of Jerusalem along the Kidron Valley. You who have been there know where, what I mean. In the valley you have the Yad Afshalom, the tomb of Afshalom you have down. Opposite you, on the slope of the Mount of Olives, you have a Russian church with domes like onions, like the Kremlin, you know. And there I saw Russians, Russian monks and priests going and talking Russian. And this for me was a very strange sensation. The name of the church in all languages is Gatsimine. Gatshemanim, this is also a Hebrew name, Gatshemanim, you know what it means. The place where you press the olive. Gatshemanim, where you press olives. So they built a church there. Why? Why is there, why did these Russians come from Vladivostok? I don't know from where, from the end of the earth. Why did they come over here? 
Because once upon a time, in my history, a Jewish boy was born whose name was Yeshua, Jesus. And he had arguments with a gentleman who were there in the temple. This was a family quarrel in our history. Our history is full of family quarrels. Full of it. Just have a look at it and you'll see. There was something there happened. He was born in Bethlehem. And he happened to walk there and go. So because a Jewish boy, 1,974 years ago, was born there, not there, but in Bethlehem, and later, as a man of 30, went this way, and he spoke Hebrew. And if you have, to this day, in the New Testament, you have some Hebrew quotations, Eli, Eli, Lama Shevaktani, Hebrew quotation. So the Russians came from Vladivostok, from I don't know where, to build a church there and to consecrate it. So they have also something to do with my history, with my Jewish history. And nobody has ever denied that he considered himself a good Jew who didn't care, come either to add or to distract from the Torah. He himself considered himself a good Jew. They came in his day. I make the mention of the Russian because that struck me most. Perhaps because of the domes when I was a child and saw those onions and I saw the Russian attire and the Russian language and I thought to myself, God, here they come to consecrate my history. They come to do it from the end of the world. It was not only they, of course. All the churches are there and all bear the same old Hebrew words, the same old Hebrew names. It goes even farther than that, and that belongs to one experience in my life when I saw, beheld with my own eyes, very near to me, a king. I was a child and I saw a king. The king was Haile Silasi, the king of Ethiopia. It was in the year 30, 36, and he went, that was in Rehova Nevi'im, the street of the prophets. He who, who knows it, you see opposite it, there is the Ethiopian consulate. He went into it, and I was told what his title was, the title of the king of Ethiopia. It was, uh, I read one sentence only concerning this. I saw Gabriel Jonathan Luria on the first time on a great and strange day in my life. The day on which my eyes plainly beheld on the other side of the street, the King of Kings, Haile Selassie, elect of God, conquering lion of the tribe of Judah, the emperor of Ethiopia. So he also has something to do with Judah. He is the conquering lion of the tribe of Judah. I mean, so it's not only the Russians, but the Ethiopian king. And as if to finish the circle, when I arrived for the first time in New York, on my way westward, I passed through the building of the United Nations, and lo and behold, I see before my eyes Ethiopians carrying banners saying that you have to save the life of Haile Selassie. And I remember that I saw him when he fled from the Italians in 36. I was a child then, and all of a sudden I saw the king. He also had something to do with the tribe of Judah, and his official title was the conquering lion of the tribe of Judah. Everyone has to do with it, with the history. There is, but all the forms it takes, I mean, this here something went wrong somewhere. Because they came not only, and they are there not only to preserve my history and to consecrate it. And wherever, as I told you, wherever you find something relating to the Bible, it is consecrated by a mosque or a church or a anything you wish. They came there not only to consecrate, they were there to fight me in the name of my very history. I am a very peaceful man. I really am, I'm a writer. I want nothing on earth but to sit down and to 
to write, to have the leisure, the time to do it. And yet, peaceful as I am, and wanting peace, I had to, to go through five wars. And if I add together all the time I did soldiering and fighting, it amounts to years of my life. And I hated each a day of it, but I had to do it. And here is also one of the paradoxes of this city. Yerushalayim, Yerushalayim, Jerusalem, has in it, goes round the word shalom, shalem, peace. And this is a city which has known wars, perhaps more than other cities. Each inch is sucking with blood in Jerusalem, in this sacred Jerusalem. And it was in this very Jerusalem that the most beautiful poems for peace were written. And the best prayers and dreams of peace and they shall turn their uh, swords into plowshares and they will study war no more. It was in Jerusalem written this. The best, the, the most beautiful visions of peace in this city which knew wars more than anything else in the world. It knew wars, it knew also new wars uh, between Jews and Jews, Jews and Arabs, whatever you wish during its, its history. Now I gave you in this uh, small uh, space of time I had some central question which built itself around the experiences of a child of Jerusalem. All, as I saw it, concerned around the question of what is the connection, the interrelationship between the essence and the outward form it takes. And as far as I could, I gave to it some sort of expression in what I wrote. I thank you so much for your attention. Barreled question, uh, which uh, I suppose we shall have to consecrate to it some uh, two semesters or three semesters to study them. I shall try to be as brief as possible. There was the first question concerning my own attitude, how I feel about it, my identification, my identity. And the second concerning relationship between Israel and the uh, Jews outside Israel. Uh, perhaps I shall start from the second point and say something which may uh, perhaps uh, not uh, find favor in your eyes, but I say what I think and I feel. I think and I feel it uh, very strongly, uh, especially nowadays. The destiny of Jews all over the world is very closely knit. And uh, I feel that uh, as the Jew amongst people, so is Israel amongst the states. Israel is the Jew amongst the states. In the sense that whenever something goes wrong, you'll find people who say that the Jew is to blame, whatever the issue may be. And since I feel that now we are going into some sort of bad period economically, I'm sure that you'll find people who will say the Jew is to blame. If there isn't enough money, if there isn't enough oil. We don't have any oil. Prices, the question of prices of oil are a question of pure monopoly, pure economical uh, demand and, uh, and offer. One who monopolizes can demand whatever price he wants 
And if you don't want, don't buy. But they'll say, and if the price of oil goes up, you'll find someone saying that it's because of the Jews. Or because of the Jewish state. And it's, this is some sort of tragic line following us through the ages. Whatever the issue was, now it is oil. If it was 30 years ago a question of, uh, of domination over Europe and the world, the first to be blamed and punished was the Jew. That was the first thing to go. And before that, in all revolutions, in all changes of uh, regimes, I mean, it was always somehow or other the blame was put on us. And I feel that this destiny applies as well to the state of Israel. If something goes wrong somewhere, they'll say this is because of the state of Israel. Had it not been for that, we would have had oil. Oil would be found in France and England and I don't know where, had it not been for the state of Israel. So there is, to my uh, own view, there is some connection uh, between the things, some strong connection between the things. Uh, I won't go more into it because I want to answer now the first half of the question. I lived, as I, in my childhood, as I told you, I lived between different, different worlds. If you have been to Jerusalem, you may, might have seen going side by side to the old city, a very young girl with miniskirt and beautiful legs, all shown. And beside her, you may see a rabbi going with his trimel and his kaftan to pray. They go side by side. This is some sort of coexistence, but they live in different worlds, on the same space. They live in different worlds, in different conceptions. The cleavage between what we call observant Jews and non-observant is there. It exists. And it runs throughout all communities. It's not the cleavage which you will find only in the Ashkenazic community. I talk about communities, Jewish communities in Israel or Sephardic communities, or Yemenite, or Turkish, or Hungarian, whatever you wish. It runs throughout all communities. I mean, two uh, different conceptions, as they seem now, those who are observing the mitzvot, as they have been formulated up to the, let's say, 18th century, I mean, uh, Afterwards, as far as I know, there has been no development in the halakha, in what is called uh, the way of uh, deciding the application of the law. There has been no uh, development, so up to the 18th century, let's say. And those who do not observe, and uh, as we are, according to our own uh, temperament, I mean, everything turns into very bitter family fights. Family fights which uh, unfortunately take on a political aspect, even though it has nothing to do with politics. It has nothing to do with politics, but anyhow, it takes a political aspect, and there are parties which are religious. I don't know what it means. A political party, political, it has to decide political questions, and it is religious. There is this mishmash that enters into it which shouldn't be there. But anyhow, the difference is there. Now, how do I see things? I personally believe, I personally believe that this way or that way, as has always been, there is bound to be an evolution in our conception of mitzvot and what to do and what not to do, which will, with time, conform more to the world in which we actually live. I have lived already long enough to see changes in this attitude as I described to you before. I mean, what was unbelievable to my grandmother is 
taken now for granted by young generations of people who consider themselves uh, religious. And they can't see, I mean, they, they would be surprised, I didn't take the trouble to, to start telling them all the details, that they who consider themselves religious would have been considered by her, by my grandmother, as hideously uh, sinner, hideous sinners. There is, and there should, I don't know whether there should be, but there will be some uh, sort of evolu evolution. For the time being, for the time being, there is as yet a strong opposition between the forces, especially concerning the question of marriage and other questions which should be, uh, which should or should not be under civil jurisprudence or uh, religious jurisprudence. I believe that in the long run, Judaism, which is a way of life, a way of life, will change its aspect, and then the whole question will change. So long as it hasn't changed, we shall be in for internal struggles. I myself, I myself, what I feel is that my feelings of and my attitude towards God, and I had a very religious grandmother, is I cannot see it within the confinement of what she thought that was right or wrong. I cannot see it, even though I consider myself a very good Jew. Something will change, but it will take time for the changes. And when it changes, the whole question won't be as acute as it, as it is now. This is the way I see it. I shall tell you how I see the question. And again, what I say is my own personal opinion. I am not a politician, I have never been. I speak only in my own name and out of my own experience. As far as I see it now, and as far as it has been till now, the question of our relations with our neighbors was not a territorial question. Had it been only a territorial question of 10 kilometers more or less that the border runs here or there, we would have had peace long ago. Long ago, we would have had peace. This question of uh, deciding, I mean, this question is really a question of deciding the boundaries. Deciding the boundaries is something to be done by parties which, both of which want peace and recognize one the other and wish to have peace afterwards. Then they start bargaining a mile more, a mile, a mile less. Unfortunately, as I see it, it's a psychological question and not a and not a territorial question. We did not have peace before the Six Days War, when the boundaries were completely different from which they are now. We did not have peace in 47, 48, when we not only were ready, but we were glad to accept the boundaries of a Jewish state which did not include Jerusalem. We were glad to accept it, and uh, I don't know if there are people who are old enough to remember it, how glad the whole Jewish people was to accept it without Jerusalem. It was supposed to be an international enclave, enclave, and there was no peace then. There was no peace before 47, when I was a child. I talked only of the five wars I undergrew, underwent as a more or less grown up person. But I knew it before it. I knew it in 36. 
in 39. Before that, I, I don't remember and I, I wasn't there. So it's not, a, not a, according to what I, the things as I see it, it's more, I speak only of our neighbors. I don't speak now of the more global question of inter-imperialistic interests whether it's the Russian Empire or China or America or other big powers playing around the oil. I don't talk about this. I talk about our relationship with the Arabs. So as far as I remember back, it was not a question of boundaries because they simply didn't recognize our right to existence. They didn't recognize it. Had they recognized it, they would have accepted it in 47, willingly. Or before. The war was there even before the state. There were wars. Two societies fighting for the same piece of land. And, uh, well, what's next? I don't know. I don't know what's next. And again, I believe that had it been only we and the Arabs, we and the Palestinian Arabs, we would have had peace long ago. But unfortunately, as it is, we have a whole question of world politics with big invested interests who are playing around this problem. Suppose we want and need peace and the Palestinians want and need peace. But we have war not only with the Palestinians. By the way, they, they were only people who didn't fight in the last war in October. All the Arab world fought, but not they. I mean, Libya doesn't need peace with Israel, neither Iraq nor Algeria, nor Saudi Arabia. And I shall give you one small example. This is outside my ken, but let's say it as it is. Gaddafi of Libya counts, I don't know, about one and a half to two million Arabs. And he has oil enough for, I think, one third of uh, Western Europe, or more than that. He alone. Now, uh, this Gaddafi with his two million Bedouins is a very close neighbor to Egypt. And Egypt is 35 million Arabs. And the strongest Arab country, the strongest. Had the Egyptian people been free with all its army, it could have swallowed Libya with the oil within half an hour, a quarter of an hour, and taken over or uh, thrown Gaddafi and put somebody else in his name. So such a Libya has a very great need that all this power, manpower, Egyptian manpower, and technical power and other be engaged somewhere else, somewhere else, and that's why inter alia, Gaddafi is so much against Israel. He, Gaddafi, with all his oil. He is the greatest and most extremist anti-Israeli he wants always the Egyptian army to be on the canal. The same goes for Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia is also a very, I mean, as far as manpower is concerned, Faisal is very weak. He has a few tribes there. And Egypt has already taken charge of part of Yemen. So he also thinks about the need that the strong Arab armies will be engaged somewhere else. I gave you only small things which may show you that things are much more complicated than they are. I wish to God that the question between us and the Arabs would be only territorial question. And I can assure you that had it been only territories, it would have been solved long, long ago. Long, long ago. I wish to go it were only that question. When it comes down to it, if they sit together with us and say, let's make peace, as the peace between France and Belgium and others, and let's decide it, you'll have peace within half an hour. 
I wish it were only territory. Uh, I uh, have known personally and been friends personally with Arabs in my childhood. I lived then, it was the neighborhood facing the Arab neighborhood. And uh, here I must say something which considers, considers the individual as an individual and the individual as part of his community. Personally, Personally, the Arabs I met, I were very lovable persons, personally, really lovable pe persons. Very kind, hospitable, hospitable, I say of my experience as a child, and emotionally involved, very emotionally involved. It was uh, sometimes uh, even easier to make friends with an Arab than to make friends with a Jew. But the fact that the Arab was my personal friend, did not change his attitude in time of war. And here I shall give you one example, one example which may be serve as an illustration to this mentality which sometimes may be bizarre, in, though it is not. There was a famous doctor in Jerusalem, eye doctor, called Dr. Ticho. His wife, Anna Ticho, is still alive and she's a well-known painter. Perhaps you've heard of her. He was a well-known uh, eye doctor and uh, he cured, his clinic was on the border. And he cured during his 40 or 50 years of practice thousands of Arabs. In 36, when the disturbances started, he was stabbed in the back by one of his patients by one of his patients, whom he saved, whose eyesight he saved. Now this may seem strange, but it isn't. It isn't. The patient was saved by this Dr. Tiho. But when this patient went to his village, and his village chief told him that the Jews are to blame for all his miseries, and he believed in it explicitly, that this is so, he found it's his duty to go and stab the third Jew. And the first one he found was this doctor who saved his eyes. Of course, personally, he was uh, attached. But what his village chief told him, and the attitude it formed, was for him a truth. And he had to act accordingly. Because if he did not belong to the Arab community, he belonged to the Jewish community. He didn't live in a vacuum. This is sometimes, it's hard to think of in the societies which are more individualistic. And one wants to think that he may perhaps live in a vacuum. It is much more, uh, I mean, uh, this fact, which may seem so in times of peace in very big cities in the West, is not so there. He is part of a certain society. And when the time comes, and if he doesn't act as one of his society, he's outside of it. He belongs to another society. And he didn't belong to the Jewish society, he belonged to the Arab society, and he had to act accordingly. So this is more, I mean, the, the question of relationship between us is more complicated. It's more complicated as it might seem. He may be a very good friend, and he is indeed, and he will save my life. But when it comes to it, he will act as part of his community. Because if he doesn't act as part of his community, he is excommunicated. He doesn't belong. Then he finds himself in a vacuum. And if he doesn't belong to the Arabs, he belongs to the Jews, and he doesn't want to belong to the Jews. So he has to act accordingly. I mean, this is to a more or less extent in every society. Even in a non-conformist society, you have to be non-conformist. You have to act accordingly. There is a certain force even within non-conformism. It is much stronger in this society. And one should take uh, notice of it. Thank you.
uh, a psychological process is a technical a technical uh, term and which may say which may embrace so many things that I may say yes it's a psychological process because everything may be a psychological process it so happened that I started my career as a psychologist I studied psychology once and I almost finished when I worked already in hospital when all of a sudden I wrote a story and I didn't care anymore for my professional career. I simply didn't care anymore and I left it. Uh, I say it only because I once dealt very much in uh, all these definitions and so now I don't know what they mean now by, by these words because the definitions themselves have changed in the last 20 years have changed. Uh, everything is psychological, in a sense. In a sense. So it's hard to answer this question. But I uh, think that usually, usually uh, what we perceive are uh, outward signs and we refer our, ourselves to these outward signs and the question of the relationship between these outward signs and the essence is the question which I ask myself and wish to give it my own uh, my own interpretation here I shall say a few more words uh, look here the question is a question of meaning each and every one looks for some sort of meaning in the world into which he finds himself born. Each of us looks for some sort of meaning. Now, till now, there were three kinds of meanings given to things. One was a meaning given by religion. The other was a meaning given by philosophy. Not science. Science never pretended to give a meaning. It only describes things, but it never pretended to tell you why the law was formed and to what purpose. Why the whole cosmos and all the galleries were formed and to what purpose. This, for this, science won't uh, answer you. He'll describe it to you, but not answer. The answer will be given either by religion or philosophy or art. And the difference between the three <coughs> art and the other two is that whilst religion and philosophy will give you a general response, a general uh, answer, which if I may use here, I shall simplify thing and say that the answer is like a penicillin or aspirin. If you have headache, the aspirin is good for John and Max and every other man. It's a ready-made mass production, good for everyone. For it. Art gives something which is very personal. It's always personal. And uh, I try to give the answer in, my, in what I did in my own personal way. If it, has, if it says something to somebody else, then it has a meaning for him. If not, it doesn't have a meaning for him. First of all, thanks for the compliment. Who, who gave me that compliment? Thank you. You read it in Hebrew? In English. Well, who are my preferred writers? I shall perhaps tell you about my preferred writers who are not Hebrew writers. I don't know how much you know Hebrew literature and how much it may say to you. If I say Agnon or Brenner or uh, such names, I don't know to what extent it will say something to you. But amongst the foreign writers, I think the writers I was most impressed by and, uh, 
and influenced and loved, I would say as so going from east to west, I would say perhaps Dostoevsky and Tolstoy and uh, Thomas Mann, of course, and uh, Marcel Proust in France. It took me some time till I discovered him, quite late in my career. But once I discovered him and read him, after having gone through all the 13 volumes, it's quite hard to go from him to other books. He's one of the giants, no doubt. Marcel Proust. And uh, I remember I was very much impressed in a much earlier stage by Dickens, Charles Dickens, in a much earlier stage. Uh, then I shall refer to two writers, which I felt they were great, but they did not uh, really uh, touch a chord in my heart. And this is James Joyce. I read him, but I didn't, I felt his greatness, but it didn't mean much to me, personally. I remained cold to it. I remained cold. I perceived it's like a mountain. You may see, I see a big mountain, but I don't like this mountain. Or a very big building, Empire State Building. It's very big, yes, but I don't like it. <laughs> so, that's about it. Uh, as far as I have uh, followed contemporary literature, that is to say things which have been published after the Yom Kippur War over the papers, and I refer to things which have some sort of literary value. I don't uh, speak about uh, articles and so, so forth and so on. I did not perceive I did not perceive any, any change in any writer uh, concerning his being true to himself. That is to say, whatever poem or story, or story I read of any writer of value, it went in the same line and in the same world this writer lived before. When you go a little to the side and don't deal in aesthetics, when it goes to politics, each of the writers became firmer in his former convictions. I mean, whatever his former stand was, if, yeah, Usually, uh, the, these classifications have very little meaning. But let's say if he was formerly what you call the right wing, la droite, the right wing, he remained but a little more so. If he was left, he remained a little more so. As if the thing only convinced him of his own be righteousness in the past. That is to say, it served, the war served everyone to prove that he was right but even a little more than he was before. I didn't say that it made some sort of changes in his attitude. Usually, it's very hard for grown-up people to change themselves. If, it, if ever it's possible, I don't know. If possible. But usually, they on, it only serves them to strengthen their own position. But on the whole, and with all this, uh, I think that not now, a little later, you, we shall start seeing some fruits of it. Because always the real fruits of experience come later. They are not journal, uh, journalistic uh, attitudes. This may come within the next five or ten years in a valuable way, not now as yet.
Thanks for listening. For more information on the 92nd Street Y New York and all of our programs, please visit us at 92ny.org.